Hi, world. Um, and I'm really chuffed that you've come to listen uh, to talk about our Thunderbirds, which are the southern ground wombal. Um, they really are an African icon, uh, both of our savannas and our grasslands, and also really ecologically important. Um, I am the project manager for the Mabula Ground Hornbill Project. I'm also the chair in a specialist, Hornbill specialist group uh, for the African chapter. Um, and so my role is to try and make sure that we protect all African hornbills, my particular love being the ground hornbills, and that we can build a lot of love and, and capacity for the conservation of hornbills in South Africa and across the continent. So whoa, let me just reframe things, sorry. Um, all right, so... Um, Everything that we do is collaborative. Um, so what I'm presenting today is absolutely um, a, a, a combination of all of these organizations work. Ground hornbills are incredibly hard to work with. They live, they live slowly. And so we really need absolutely everyone on board if we're ever going to make a difference for the species. So from NGOs in South Africa to our national parks and national agencies, through to our provincial national parks, our captive facilities that support us with captive breeding and education programs, private reserves, and then all of the academic institutions that really help us understand uh, what, what it is we need to know about these birds to be able to make the best conservation decisions for them. So we have two species of ground hornbills on the African continent. The beautiful red one is our southern ground hornbill, which one that I'm focused on, um, which is found from southern Kenya all the way through to the eastern Cape in South Africa. And the blue uh, distribution map is for the Abyssinian or northern ground hornbill, which is far north of the equator, north of the forests. Our southern ground hornbill, unfortunately, in South Africa is listed as endangered, and it's now sliding towards critically endangered. We still have a population in decline, and we're doing absolutely everything in our power to try and turn things around for the species. Also, next to nothing is known about the Abyssinian or northern ground hornbill. Um, so we are starting a northern ground hornbill working group. Um, we have a PhD student in, in Ghana who's starting the, the very basic research onto the species. And once we know more, we'll be able to better assess what their conservation status is. But for today, I'm just going to be focusing on the southern ground hornbill. So in this map, uh, you can see the, the African range. Um, and then down in South Africa, the, the little blue squares are what we had. Those are all of our historic records as we have them per the literature. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's across much of Western South Africa. But if you look at the tiny, tiny red squares, that is all we've got left. So you can see either the birds have become totally locally extinct across big parts of South Africa, or especially down in the Eastern Cape and much of KwaZulu-Natal, are highly fragmented. So we don't have a lot to work with, but if you look at the top right-hand corner, that tells us a very clear story. The shape of that big red blob at the top is our Kruger National Park. And so that makes it very clear to us that people are the problem, because if we can, you know, all of the threats are people-related, and so the birds are doing absolutely perfectly within our our biggest national park in that top right of the slide. And then along the north of the South African border, where we border on Botswana and Zimbabwe, that is actually a picture of hope for us. Population was wiped out in the 1980s um, for a number of reasons. A drought combined with excessive poisoning campaigns by farmers. Um, and what we're seeing there is a natural recolonization now. And so this for us really shows that if we just keep doing what we're doing and we give these birds time and space, they can recover. For the longest time, especially when my parents were doing their research in Kruger National Park, all of our visions of this bird were you know, these groups striding through the perfect African savannah. But actually, since we've turned our focus away from our protected areas and are focusing more in the in the, the more vulnerable areas, protected areas, this is a normal picture of a ground hornbill habitat. Um, they live in amongst the villages, in amongst homesteads, in amongst cattle, uh, very much been an in part of the African rural landscape for millennia. And this is where the conservation needs to happen. And as I said, the problem really is us. I'm going to take you through uh, a little animation that we've done. Um, we're in the process of having this translated into all the relevant languages for 
Africa. Uh, we've got some amazing celebrities who've offered their voices for this. Um, but this is just our English version, our test run. Um, but this will just give you a little insight into uh, some of the threats that the species face and some of the things that can be done for that. Um, so sit back and enjoy. <laughs> In a small village, there lived a clever girl called Knowledge. One night, as her grandfather said good night, she asked him why the rains had not come. The grandfather said that many years ago, there were these giant birds called the brown hornbill, also known as thunder or rain birds, and a magnificent call that would often be followed by good rain. But he hadn't seen one in many years. Maybe that was why there was no rain. The young girl fell into a deep sleep and was startled by a loud sound. It was the ground hornbill. The giant bird greeted her by name and asked if she could help him. He would return to the village and call for the rains. As the two of them walked, the giant thunderbird said that most of the trees had been cut down, forcing them to leave. He said that they only needed one tree per family. And the little girl said she would ask her villagers to protect those specific trees. Thank you, said the bird. The few that had stayed only had strange-looking trees to roost on. The giant bird pointed to an electricity post. But these trees had often hurt or electrocuted them, forcing their families to leave too. As they continued, knowledge jumped with fright as she saw a large puff adder on the track. But the giant bird marched past her and with one stab of its head killed it and ate it. She was so grateful that snakes terrified her and her family. The giant bird then pointed at a dead rat lying in the field and was about to eat it when the little girl said no. It was probably poisoned and it would kill him if he ate it, she said. Some farmers still use poison to keep the predators or rats away from their livestock or food. The little girl said she would discuss alternatives with the village, like good kraals, herd dogs or cats to keep away the predators and rats. Thank you, said the bird as he hopped excitedly mm -hmm. along. The bird then walked past a window and immediately began to attack it. The little girl quickly covered the window with a blanket and he instantly stopped. Why did you do that, she asked. The bird said he had seen another ground hornbill in the window and needed to defend his territory, nest and wife. <laughs> While chuckling to herself, she covered some of the other lower windows so he break them. As they passed a particular house, the giant bird pointed at the house and said that some of the men from that house had tried to catch and kill him, believing that if they did, they would steal his great voice and make themselves more powerful. The little girl thought for a moment and said that the voice of one man is not a voice thinks of I will tell my people of all the dangers you face. I think we can make our village safe for you to return, and hopefully, if you are happy and safe, also rain and perhaps kill a couple of snakes as well. The bird began to flap excitedly and call loudly. The sound of thunder echoed through the air. And I think they will listen, she said. After all, her name was Knowledge. So that just, you know, kind of highlights some of the major threats, things like the window breaking, uh, poisoning, secondary poisoning from things like poison rats, um, either accidentally from rodenticide or farmers putting out artificial baits for uh, so-called pest predators like jackals or hyenas. Um, one of the big key things that we're finding in a lot of, a lot of our commercial game farms um, and hunting areas is lead toxicosis. This is well known for vultures across the world and water birds, um, but only in the last couple of years have we found that this is also particularly relevant to, so to the southern ground hornbill. And so we are working together with our hunting agencies in South Africa to start reducing the, the, the use of lead, and if lead is still used, that no offal is left in the bush where any scavenging animals are able to find it. There's a little bit of trade for traditional medicine, but this seems to be mostly opportunistic. We don't, we're not seeing the kind of trade that one sees for things like pangolins or vultures. Um, and then, you know, just the persecution for breaking windows um, and electrocution, uh, particularly on transformer boxes. 
So they, they have a world of threats, people-based threats um, being hurtled at them. And this is also uh, coupled with a really slow life history strategy. These birds can live up to 70 years old. They're big bodied. They have all the life history traits that make them so much more vulnerable to extinction. They will only uh, fledge a maximum of one chick per group per year. And in each group, is just an alpha pair because they um, corporate are breeders. Um, so only the alpha pair breeds. And so actually there's only one adult female per group. So regardless of how big the group size is, whether it's six or nine birds, there is only ever a maximum chance of one chick being fledged per, per group per year. They reach maturity very late, uh, it's, uh, eight to 10 years in captivity, but it's so much later in the wild because first they have to attain that very all important alpha position to become one of the contributing breeders. Within the South African context, they also have incredibly large special requirements. Each family group needs about 80 to 100 square kilometers, and this can cover any number of different land uses. It could be sugarcane, timber, some natural grassland, villages, um, and so there can be a lot going on just within a single territory. They also have really high parental investment. They have this extensive learning phase. The youngsters really are quite stupid um, until they're about five years of age, by which time they've learnt all of their bush skills that they need. How to kill a highly venomous snake, how to roost safely, how to avoid predation from things like cheetah or leopards or caracal. Um, and the cool thing is, though, if we remove all the human threats, if we can just get them to five, then they basically are to live through until the, their ripe old age, um, you know, assuming none of the human threats come into play. So, so they need a lot of time and they need a lot of space. So this is what a typical ground hornbill group would look like. You would have the alpha male. The female has the blue throat coloration on her throat. Um, and all of the other birds within that group are often the sons of, of the alpha pair, but they will also take on non-kin. And this is the army that helps the alpha male defend the territory and feed the female, and when the chick hatches, to feed the chick. So they can't do it alone as a pair. They need this whole male army to support them through a breeding cycle. So we look at an average of 3.5 group size. So basically anything more than three is good. A pair can breed, but they need exceptional environmental conditions for that to happen. But now we're starting to see a couple of tricky things. We're starting to see some males within the population that have female coloration. Um, and we also know there's a skewed mortality because the young females get kicked out really young from the groups. Um, and they're so much more vulnerable to predation and things like that. Um, so, so there's a lot going on within this really complex social structure in these birds. So this is an example of some satellite tracking data that was done in the associated private nature reserves in the low felt of South Africa. Um, so you can see two hypothetical groups there, and you can see that their movements within a year, there's barely any overlap between the territories. So these birds are really, really fixed onto that territory, defend it like it's nobody's business, but it has to sustain them through the good and the bad for decades, whether it's through times of drought, huge wildfires, that little plan, all that they have to sustain them for decades. And then in terms of, of dispersal, what we understand now is the young females disperse uh, almost all of them, and it's usually about 11 months of age. So these little girls are barely a year old, and they need to go out and make it in the big bad world. Um, and they seem to settle um, much further than the males do. So they, they move more than four territories from their natal territory. Whereas the males, some stay, some go, um, it's 45 months on average, but really we've got birds that are 22 years old and still help us in their natal group. They have not yet set out to find a breeding position. And generally the boys kind of just move next door. Um, they don't like to move that far from mum and dad. And so really the key to conservation for this cultural icon is held within the hands of the people who share the landscape with them. So this is a lovely example of some habitat in southern KwaZulu-Natal. And birds, this is where they share the landscape with the people that live there. And so we're working through a custodianship 
um, program where the people they take on ownership um, of these birds, they protect them, they they do the monitoring of the nest, and and we support them as much as we can, whether it's with um, educational materials, um, help if a official nest or if their nest is blown down in a big storm, we're able to replace that for them within within the next year. So we really are relying heavily on the people who share the land with the birds, and we basically have to go territory by territory if we're going to make this work. We have an extensive education campaign, Temba, our Hornbill mascot. Temba means hope in Zulu. And really, we do feel there's such hope for the species because the conservation that we've developed really do work. And for us, it is now just a scale of upscaling that and making sure that the work that we're doing on the ground really can have a really positive impact on the actual population. We've tested the tools, we know they work. Um, and, and the response from people is enormous. There's real, there's real positivity around the species. And so we just need to keep going. And I really believe we'll be able to make a difference for the species. Here's an example of the window breaking. On the left is a group in the middle of a, a, a terrible territorial battle. It all happens up in the air. But when that happens in a rural landscape, we end up with broken glass windows. And if you look at the image on the bottom right, you can see that there's actually blood. The birds have cut themselves on the glass. So not only is the risk there that they're really annoying the people that they share the land with, this costs money, you know, a lot of these rural schools don't have electricity. Um, and so, you know, these kids sit through the worst winters with the wind howling through these windows that the birds have broken. Um, so it really doesn't make for good neighbors um, and also has the additional risk that the birds can actually really quite seriously injure themselves when they break the glass. It's just as soon as they see their reflection in that shiny surface, it's an enemy that's come into their territory to steal their wife, to steal their nest tree, and they have to fight every time. <clears throat> this is one of the solutions that we've put in place. It's a perforated vinyl film called Contravision. And what's really cool with this is it cuts the reflection from the outside, but from the inside allows the light in and the kids can see out from inside the class. You know, normally these schools would just paint the low windows, but that makes the classrooms really dark and gloomy. So this way the kids have really nice light coming in, streaming in through the windows to allow them to continue with their work, but it cuts the reflection. And with that, the birds no longer see themselves and, and don't have that desperate urge to fight themselves. This is an example of a really lovely nest in Kruger National Park in a big old leadwood tree. And ground humble's nest hollows, and you can see the, the dimensions of a tree that are needed. And we're losing these trees in the landscape, whether it's to um, increase storms, increase flooding, fire effect, elephant impact. Um, but what is happening is nests are really now a limiting factor for these birds. Um, but luckily, this is something we can do something about. We've gone through an extensive testing process of developing these artificial nests made of artificial materials. Um, the whole proviso of these nests is that they for nests, they're basically, we're trying to make them that they couldn't be more perfect for the birds. Um, and you can see the female on the right has made her choice there. She's absolutely spurned the nest on the bottom and taken up on the top. Um, and the nice thing is we're seeing chicks fledging out of these nests. The birds are taking to them readily. Um, and now what we're doing is making sure that they're actually climate proof into the future. We're suspecting that we might be losing embryos to heat waves with the, with the rising temperatures in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and so what is we having these waves of 44, 45 degrees Celsius, and we're losing embryos mid-incubation. So what we're looking to do is have nests that are even more insulatory than the nest. So they're protecting those precious embryos so that they can incubate through to hatching and they can be reared and take up their place in the wild. This is a little example of, of some of the chicks at one of these nests. <coughs> That's last year's girl that's fledged, and that's dad bringing a bit more leaf lining and little bits of food hidden in that. And everyone's always very interested in the new little chick that's in the nest. So as I said, one of the issues that we have is impact from elephants knocking trees over. Um, but what we found is it's only certain trees that are really vulnerable to elephant impact, particularly female marula trees, the ones that bear the fruit. Um, and so we're working with a local NGO called Elephants Alive um, to install beehives in the nest trees where, which are vulnerable um, to elephant impact. 
when we choose nests in a in a in a wild um sorry when we choose nests to put up for artificial nests we can choose trees then that are absolutely have nothing no interest for elephants so we can put them in big old dead leadwoods big figs that are way bigger than anything that an elephant could damage but for the existing wildness this way we can do everything to protect that valuable resource the other thing that we do is we take the second hatch check. In ground hondles, they have something, they have a policy called obligate brood reduction. So that means they may lay two eggs, but they will only ever rear one chick. So if the first chick hatches early, five or six days before the second, and if that first chick is good and strong and healthy, the parents will simply neglect the other little chick. However, if there's something wrong with that first chick, they will then rear the second chick. So it's kind of like an insurance policy to so that all of the energy that you put into the breeding season will allow you to get that one precious chick out at the end of the season. So we've been taking these redundant chicks, bring them artificially, and using these as the stock for reintroducing southern ground hornbills back into areas where they've become locally extinct. Here's a female in one of the natural nests looking up at us. What we do is we, we check the eggs, we uh, candle them to assess the date of hatching, and we go back when that end egg is just hatching or that second chick has just, just hatched, because we want to make sure that we're not in any way impacting um, the output from that wild for the original, the number one chick, sorry, um, as you can see in the bottom image. So there's big one, it's growing, it's fat and healthy, so we're just waiting for that second one to hatch actually take for the reintroduction stock. Um, we're able to really um, age the embryos accurately, and this means that we only go to the nest twice. So there's very little distance at the nest, um, and our research has shown that it has no negative effect at all on the existing wild population. So in a way, it's quite an unusual reintroduction because normally you would be taking birds from the wild and moving them to somewhere else in the wild. But here we're taking birds that would naturally die in the net and we're using these as the stock for a restoration. So it has no impact on the existing wild population, which is really cool. Um, to do this right, though, we have over the years learned that we have to be really careful about not just growing physically healthy birds, but they have to be psychologically and physiologically strong. Um, and so over time, we've uh, the skills and we know what's needed and we had to build a specialized rearing center for that and I'm just going to take you through a little walk through what the center looks like I can find play there we are sorry <laughs> my computer is not behaving today So, so that just gives you an idea um, of, of how we do the rearing. The birds come from the nests and they fledge into those big aviaries that radiate from the nests on the second story of that building. And from there, those chicks are then introduced into what we call bush schools. So they to foster families so that they're constantly learning from, from the, their mentors in the group. And from there, they go out into bush schools where they are wild experienced mentors who then train them in the bush. So this is where they're learning their real bush skills. And so by the time they reach four or five, they really have had all the teaching at all the right developmental stages, and they themselves are ready to go on and become their own mentors to another bush school. And so it's a slow and complicated process, but we really are upscaling now. And our season, we had 75% of our reintroduced groups breeding. So, you know, it's working and it really honestly is just a, a, a mission of, of upscaling. So I want to thank you very much for your time, um, for joining us today to hear about the project. We have so many supporters and sponsors, so I would ask that you please do check in with our website um, to see everyone who makes the work, this work of ours possible. Thank you very much.
Lucy, that was awesome. What a charismatic creature. And you really have spared no detail in, in focusing on their entire life history to try and conserve them and showcase all the, uh, you know, what makes them so special. I also love that video, the first video that you showed. Uh, what a special video. Is that on the website? So I, I've got up groundhornbill.org.za. Uh, that's where people can find that video and everything else that you're doing. So, so not that not the animation we're waiting until we get the final voiceovers by the really cool people uh yeah. not but we, we we're going for for better voices than here um so what we're hoping then once that is out kids will be sharing this on their phone um yeah. so hoping that it's going to be fun of kids interacting everyone's got a smartphone these days but also yeah. they can take that messaging home to their parents so we're hoping this is going to out and into across all of the range within our communities well how special i hope you do follow up with joe and the biofest generally we'd love to share that out because it's a really special program so lucy uh, again time flies and you're having fun with these programs thank but thank you so so much for for sharing your enthusiasm with us today all the amazing work you're doing uh, if people want to donate or contribute to the amazing work that you're, you've got up again I'll, I'll leave that site up for a minute um but thank you so much for sharing your story today with us <laughs> Have a wonderful well, day. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. It's been really fun. Oh, our pleasure, Lucy. It's so much fun. And again, cool. we've got the Cheers. all around.